every time you laid your hand upon us, praise you for your breath, praise you for your fragrance, praise you for your name. We just praise you for you, Jesus, and all that you are, hallowed be thy name. Thank you that you're here tonight to breathe thy sweet breath and give again thy touch upon everyone who's longing for it. We just pray you'll move in our aisles and lay thy hand upon lives and glorify thyself in every heart. In thy sacred name we ask it and for your glory. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. I do thank the Lord for the privilege of this week with you. And I do want to thank you for the fellowship of your spirits. Your prayers, your love, your openness to the word of God. I appreciate that. You know, sometimes when you folks get singing tonight, I thought, wonder why they just don't go on up. <laughs> but someday that's going to happen. You know it? You know it? And we're getting ready for that hour. I don't think it's going to be long. But there's just a few more traces and etchings that have to take place. And there's a few more that have to come in to this body. Yes. And when the body is completed, there isn't anything that can keep him from coming. Whether all the Jews are back in Jerusalem that's supposed to be there or not, that isn't what's going to bring the Lord back. Whether all the wars and rumors of wars are over or not, they'll go on. That's not what's going to bring the Lord back. This is all his dealing with the nations and his talking to them. But he's doing another thing in the world today. And this is what the Christian must keep their eyes on. Don't get your information from the newspapers. And don't get it from those mm -mm -mm commentators because most of them don't know what they're talking about, really. They don't know what they're talking about. No. You get your information from the way the wind is blowing. <laughs> and if you have ears to hear, you know what that means. Do you know there's a wind in the earth today that's blowing? And God is moving by his spirit. And look at what God is doing in the earth today. And get your directions from God. And get in the move of God and move with him. Amen. All right. All right. I... Bless you, everyone, in the name of the Lord. And uh, I know he who planted this vine here, he's doing a good job watering it. And his eyes are continually upon it, and he's taking good care of it. And his work will go on. His work will go on. He needs each one of you, and... and I, I want to thank you for being so willing to become involved in what God is doing here. You'll never regret it. You will never, ever regret it. I ask you, sometimes when the dear Holy Spirit reminds you of me, will you pray for me? I have no other thought in this world but preaching this glorious gospel till he comes or until he takes me home I haven't another interest in this world 
but doing his sacred holy will. So I thank you tonight for your offering, and I don't have any other interests. I don't have another interest in this world but to do his holy will. So that's where your money will go, to do the will of the Lord. Amen. Now I thank you. The Lord has the Lord has just done a marvelous job of taking care of me. All my life I have lived by faith since he called me. I have never ever been in a position where I had a salary or a promise of anything. And somebody says, you mean you just live from hand to mouth? I said, that's right, but it happens to be his hand. <laughs> and my mouth, so that isn't so bad, is it? <laughs> that isn't so bad, is it? I think he's wonderful, don't you? Yes. And I do thank you for your invitation to return. And if Jesus tarries and the two business managers get together, the will of the Lord be done. Amen? Yeah. Yes. All right, now will you turn to the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel? I'm going to begin reading with the fifth verse. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren. They both were now well stricken in years. It came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled. Fear fell upon him. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, Many shall rejoice at his birth. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. As far as I'm going to read now, this is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was born at a, a time of transition in church history. And if you listen tonight, you'll hear something. A time when God was through with a lot of things that we read about and things that were happening in religious circles all through the Old Testament. God was moving on. You know, he does that. He does that. And God's plan and God's program is always on time. He he just moves on. All through the Old Testament, God is dealing with Israel. 
getting ready to do one thing. There was one thing God wanted to do. And he takes all those 4,000 years of the Old Testament time and period to do it. He wanted to send into the world his only begotten son. This was his promise way back in Genesis. And God keeps his covenants and keeps his promises. And... He wanted to bring that son. Did you theologians here tonight, did you ever wonder why God was so long sending Jesus into the world? Did you ever wonder why he didn't send him back there in the second chapter of Genesis? Why didn't God send Jesus just after Adam failed? And why didn't he send him after those sons of Adam and Eve got into trouble? And why didn't he send him in Moses' time when he said, told us Moses was likened to the one he would send? Why didn't he send him then? Did you ever wonder why it took God so long to send Jesus? God always builds his platform for what he's going to do. God always prepares the soil for what he's going to do. Our God does, his work is just right, isn't it? And perfect in every detail. So God had to deal with Israel and bring Israel to the place where they were through with every other God. Israel's worships idols and, and uh, God chastises them for that and it isn't very long until they're back worshiping idols again. And he had to send heathen nations to chastise them. And then they repented and came back to God. And then they turned back to idol worship again. And then God had to raise up somebody else to come and deal with those Jews and deal with Israel and deal with them about worshiping their idols. And finally, he, you know, he sent them into Babylonian captivity. And it wasn't until they were down in Babylon, <clears throat> away from the promised land and away from Jerusalem and away from the temple and everything that was there that they got their eyes open. And their hearts were completely through with idols. And then God said, all right, then he'd bring them back to their land. And he brought them back up to Jerusalem and began to prepare the way to send his son. When Israel was through with other gods, now he could send the God, the God. And immediately... He began making preparation to send Jesus in the world. And that brings us to the story of John the Baptist because John the Baptist was to prepare the way for Jesus to come. And, and God gets his setting here and talks to these people and finds just the right people, just the right people, just the right parents for this boy to bring him into the world, little John, to prepare the way for Jesus to be manifest. We're standing right in that transition period today. We really are. When I said God was through with a lot of things back there in the Old Testament and he begins to bring his people through all that maze and bring through the manifestation of Jesus. We're living in a time today when God is through with a lot of things in religious circles. He's just through with it. He's just through with it. We, we, it's a transition period when some things are drying up 
and other things are coming alive and coming through and and God is moving on the plan of God just moves right on moves right along in the purposes of God and so Zacharias and Elizabeth Zacharias was a priest and it was his time now to minister before the Lord in the temple and so he was up there in the temple and Elizabeth was back at home in the hill country and Zacharias was ministering and the Lord came to him and promised him this child but first God had put it on their hearts to pray for this child because there was no son in his family to be the next priest. This is the thing that happened in the priesthood, that the oldest boy was the next priest, and then his son was the priest, and then his son was the priest. And Zacharias was the last priest, and he had no son to be the next priest. And they were crying to God that God would give them a son, that God would give them a priest. And I want you to see God's working. I just want you to see God. And so this child is born, and God even gave him the name. He said, you call him John. Call him John. Call him John. And he was born, and they called him John. And I don't want to go into all the details of his birth. But he was born, and they called him John. And just think how Zacharias and Elizabeth would love this little boy. He's to be the next priest. And how they would pray with him, and how they would train him for the priesthood. And how they would talk to him about the tabernacle and the temple. And they would talk to him about the little lambs that was offered up there for sacrifice. And they would tell him about the robes that he would wear. And they would talk to him about the traditions and the ceremonies. And, and tell him the history of Israel. And uh, all of these things that a priest should know to follow in his father's footstep and minister. God had given Zacharias so many promises. And I read them to you. That because of this little boy's birth, there would be much joy, there would be much gladness, many would rejoice at his birth, and there were all these wonderful promises of God given to them. And, and how they loved him and took care of him and watched over him. But John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's birth. While John, the, the father and the mother was telling him all of this and loving this little lad and praying with him, praying over him. And one day something happened. Something happened. It's a beautiful thing that happened. John, I can see John come to his father. And he says, Dad, I have something to tell you something to tell you. Dad, you keep talking about the little lambs that I'm going to sacrifice on the altar in the temple. And, and you tell me how about this service that goes all the way back to when God showed Adam how to kill the little lamb and sacrifice it and Adam was clothed with its skin. And you're telling me all of this, Dad, but somehow it doesn't ring a bell within me. There isn't anything in me that responds to that. But this spirit, Dad, there's, there's like another spirit inside of me. Dad, there's another voice inside of me. And Dad, this voice talks to me. And this voice moves over me. This voice speaks to me. 
And every time you talk about lambs being sacrificed on the altar up in the temple, this voice inside of me says something about, I don't understand it, Dad, but it says something about the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You know, Zacharias didn't know what to tell him. Zacharias didn't know how to handle that. Zacharias said, now, now Johnny boy. Now, don't get excited and don't you get fanatical. Now, we, the Lord gave you to us to train and to take care of, and we're to train you for the priesthood. God gave you to us, you know. And, and the angel appeared to me and told me that you was going to bring joy to our hearts and joy to the people. Now, now, don't you go out on a limb and get some other ideas about something that's going to happen, John. Johnny boy. Now be careful. Just be careful, Johnny. All right, Dad. All right, Dad. Come here, I want to talk to you. And he'd show him, look at the beautiful robes that you're going to wear. John, look at these garments. I want to show you my garments that I wear when I'm up there ministering as a priest. I want to show you the garments, the robes that you can wear. Daddy, I'm sorry, but when you're talking to me about this, there's that voice inside of me says something to me about locusts and honey and, and skins of animals. When you talk to me about going up to Jerusalem, Dad, I don't want to go to Jerusalem. This little boy wasn't born in Jerusalem. They lived way out in the hill country. God took care of that and saw to it he wasn't even born near Jerusalem. I don't want to go up to Jerusalem, Dad. Will you let me go to the desert? Let me go out. I want to go to the wilderness. This voice inside of me is calling me to the wilderness. I want to go there. I want to go there. Zacharias couldn't understand that. He didn't get his training for the temple in the wilderness. What's happening to my boy? What's happening to our John? What is this thing that's happening to him? No, Dad, every time you talk about the temple, there's another voice inside of me that wants to sing, that wants to cry out. What is it saying? Well, it goes like this. Every valley shall be exalted. He's, that voice isn't talking about the city. It's talking about the valleys. And it says every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. You want me to go up to Mount Zion? That voice inside of me says every mountain and hill will be brought low. It says something about crooked places being made straight and rough places plain. I'm sorry, Dad. I don't want to go to Jerusalem. I don't want to go up to that temple. I don't want to. How many of you think God might have been dealing with little Johnny? In that... This boy is in a hard spot. He's in a hard spot. His dad is so involved. And here is the history of all Judaism, the history of all Israel behind them. And nobody before had said anything about this. 
I wonder if Zacharias one day up in the temple didn't go in there and say, I wonder if the Holy Scriptures has anything to say about this. Let's see what Isaiah says. And you know, God, that same spirit that, that's in that boy would say, Zacharias, go back and read Isaiah. And he turns over the prophets and begins to read the prophet. And oh, my dear, that voice that's in my boy must be the very same. Listen what it says. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. It's prophesied in the holy prophets. Don't you think, Zacharias? Zacharias says, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, what kind of a child do we have anyhow? What kind of a child do we have? It's prophesied in the Holy Scriptures, these things that this boy is trying to tell us. We'd better take our hands off and commit him to God. Don't you think that's the best thing to do? Don't you think it's the best thing to do? Just commit him to God. And so John the Baptist heads for the wilderness. And he gets out there alone with the Lord. And the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to John in the wilderness. Now I want to show you this in the Holy Scriptures. Do you like the Holy Bible? Do you? Do you like to find things in the Holy Scriptures? Do you? Well, you turn over to the third chapter of Luke and you will find something. Maybe you hadn't noticed it before. Maybe you hadn't noticed it before. The third chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. The, the scriptures being fulfilled. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm about to be blessed. <laughs> the holy scriptures being fulfilled. You know, we're living in a time when the word of the Lord is coming through. When the word of God is being fulfilled, the holy scriptures are being fulfilled. Search the scriptures. Search them. They're being fulfilled in our day. When I go into the denominational churches and the Lord gives me some marvelous opportunities in them, and I put on my robe, and walk down the aisles in the professional, no, 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 processionals, like the rest of them, and come to the pulpit and, and say to them, I come to you a fulfillment of prophecy. In the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons, come on, and your daughters shall prophesy. So I, I am a fulfillment of prophecy. So I make no apologies whatsoever for being a daughter that prophesies. <clears throat> ah, the word of the Lord was trying to get through. And in the third chapter of Luke, look at all the channels the word of the Lord had to come through. And right in the first verse, 
in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now there's, God had to get past him. Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. That's the second one the word of the Lord had to get past. Herod, Tetrach of Galilee. There's the third one the word of the Lord had to get past. His brother Philip, Tetrach of Aturia, of the region of Trachonitis. And Lysanias, the Tetrach of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being high priests. at six. The word of the Lord came to John. Did you ever see that before? That, that God had to get through and pass seven of those men in high places. And the word of the Lord came to little John out there in the wilderness, clothed in camel skin, eating wild locusts and honey. When it came to him, John heard that word, heard that word. One day, it was burning in his bosom, burning in his bosom. Jesus was born just six months after John the Baptist. But it seems that these two hadn't spent very much time together. God was working in both of them. And one day, Jesus came out there in the wilderness when John the Baptist was having a Baptist meeting and baptizing. Here came Jesus walking toward him. And that voice that had been speaking to him and teaching him and talking to him rose up within him and John the Baptist says behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world hallelujah at last this holy thing that was working in him had come to a fulfillment. It had come to a fulfillment. And he realized the fulfillment of what was going on. This hunger, this holy hunger, this holy disturbance, this holy disturbance moving in this man that made him so unhappy in that old thing, so restless in that old setup. He couldn't fit into that temple. He couldn't fit into their meetings. He couldn't fit into their doctrines and creeds and, and their services and the order of things up there. He couldn't get interested in it. He couldn't fit in that thing at all. I want to ask you, I want to ask you, how many here tonight have come to a place in your life with the Spirit of God dealing with you and disturbing you and, and upsetting you and frustrating you and following you and preceding you and dealing with you until you can't fit into anything in religious circles anymore? You go here and you don't fit. You just don't fit. And you go there, and you're something round and square, whole. And you go there and you don't fit. And you go there and you don't fit. You say, what is the matter with me? Nobody else seems to feel like I do. Once in a while, you meet somebody who does feel like you do. And you have a little bit of fellowship. And you say, what will we do? Where will we go? What is wrong with us? Are we the ones who are backslidden? Are we the ones who are all out of order? 
but you know there's a voice inside of me that's talking to me and dealing with me, and I can't fit in to the old order of things. Well, honey, if you would meet John the Baptist and sit down beside that little guy in camel coat, he could comfort your heart. And he'd say, if I were you, I, well, you know, he would say, I had to come out. I had to come out. John, you came out? Yes, I did. I had to come out. They were all talking, my dad, even my dad, my mother, they talked to me about a labor and was trying to tell me about the washing of the, and the order of service at that labor and so on. And all the time my father was talking labor, down inside of me that voice was saying, baptism. Baptism, baptism, baptism. And I, I didn't fit into that labor business. And he says, one day when Jesus came and this voice inside of me thundered, behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He it is who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Yes, God. And John knew that that thing in him was being satisfied and that voice was being released. And he wasn't fanatical, but this was God. Those little lambs that they wanted him to kill and sacrifice and keep that thing going. He says, I couldn't kill one of those little lambs, but I couldn't kill one of them. But you know, the day came when that veil in the temple was rent in twain and those little lambs were never sacrificed anymore. The time had come when God's true lamb hung out there on Mount Calvary and the cross, just as John the Baptist had prophesied. And they came to John's baptism the next day, and his message was still the same. Behold, the lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And they flocked to John's baptism because you know why, honey? All over Jerusalem and all around Judea, there were all kinds of people who were sick and tired of sacrificing lambs as John was. They, and, and they recognized this as the voice that was coming from God. 400 years since there had been a prophet in Israel. 400 years they hadn't heard a word from the Lord, thus saith the Lord. 400 years since anything had come through from God out of heaven. And now here's a voice with the word of the Lord, anointed by the precious Holy Spirit that points to the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. John says, I'm not worthy to loose the bows on and the knots on his shoes, but he it is who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We know that prophecy was fulfilled, don't we? And the Old Testament is closed, and the temple service is closed, just as God's Holy Spirit said it would be. And that's the end of that Old Testament regime. But the work of God goes on, goes on. We're living right down here now in another, in another 
period of transition when God's Spirit is, is moving on. It's a wonderful thing that God has been doing in the earth in church history. And, and we, we look back through church history and God raised up Martin Luther and we had the Lutheran church and he raised up John Wesley and we had the Methodist church and here came those holiness preachers and then we had many different holiness groups Missionary Alliance and Nazarene and the holy, uh, holiness churches of all kind, the assemblies of God and all the rest of the denominations, the whole crop of them. And I suppose the most of us have come up through some church, one or another. Some are Lutherans and some are Baptists and some are Methodists and some are Presbyterians. And whatever church you have come through, thank the Lord for it. Thank him for it. Thank him for what that church contributed to you. I thank the Lord for all the way that he led me. And, and what the denominations have ministered to my heart. I thank the Lord for it. But honey, just as sure as you're out there and I'm up here and God is in heaven, God is moving in the earth today. Amen. He is. He is. And the, the whole thing that God is doing, it's like a, it's like a stalk of wheat. It's just like a stalk of wheat. How many of you have seen wheat grow? Now you mean the rest of you not going to know what I'm talking about? Have you seen rye or oats or grain grow? Come on, raise up your hand if you've had. That's better. That's better. You've seen grain grow. And here is this long green stem just that long green stem. The, the farmer planted that wheat in the ground. And we see this waving out there, this beautiful green thing waving in the wind. And we'll say, what is that? Well, it's wheat. Well, it's wheat. That, that's wheat. Oh, I, that looks like grass. It's wheat. It's really wheat. Well, there came, there comes a time when that green stem begins to get golden brown, golden brown. Things begin to change. They begin to change. You know, I have been around some places when, when, the, when that stem began to get brown and people would get all excited and want to pray it green again. To go back to the old thing, to go back to the old ways, and let's hold on to what we have. Let's hold on to what we have. But God never stands still. God goes on. God goes on. And we are at the place now where God is getting his crown. That, that, that whole wheat field, it's all Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Assembly of God. And it's coming through to a head at where the real kernel that he wants, the real crop that he wants, the real grain like that that was planted in the ground, that like is coming back to like and God God is drying up the stems and he's drying up the stalks and bringing through the real thing that he's coming back for he really is he really is and there's a lot of things in religion that's drying up on the stem it, it is and they're they're God knows the, the, the programs, the machinery to keep that thing green, to keep it green and to keep it going. 
and the, 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 to try to revive something that used to be. And then they had all kinds of committees and organizations and more committees and more organizations to try to keep the thing green, to keep it green, to keep it like it used to be. God isn't doing things that, that have been done. That's done. That's past. God is moving on to the ultimate, to the ultimate, finishing his church, finishing his body, finishing his bride, and getting her ready to take her out of here, to take her out of here, to give this last, our manifestation of Jesus Christ and then lift her right out of here. And John the Baptist is that, that forerunner. And we're living in the very same place. Honey, if you're in a place tonight where you don't fit in what you're in, I would say to you in Jesus' name, just just. Follow that voice that's on the inside. Listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Listen to what the Holy Ghost is saying. He knows the will of God. He does. And he's calling you on and he's calling you out. Go out after him and follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Amen. 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 Well, well, what'll happen? What'll happen? Oh, well, the same thing will happen to you that happened to all the rest of us when we came out. We had to come out too. The, the way back there when the Lord baptized me and the Holy Ghost from the pulpit, the pastor asked our family to leave. My father was the head deacon in the church. My mother taught the Bible class. I taught Sunday school class ever since I was a teenager. And when he heard we had received this baptism of the Holy Spirit, he says, I don't want people speaking in tongues in my church. And I understand there are those among us who are of this number. And uh, we would just be happy if they would just remove their membership of themselves and find fellowship elsewhere. Hallelujah, I'm walking with the King. <laughs> Praise his holy name, walking with the King. So Dad and Mother and I got our walking papers. But it's, <clears throat> it's, 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 it's nice, it's nice just to walk on with Jesus. Just to walk on with Jesus. Bless their hearts, bless their hearts. And, and he's gathering out of all of the churches and everywhere, everywhere. There are all kinds of circles today that you just don't fit in. You don't fit in. Now, there's a lot of things in, in even what's supposed to be pretty religious, pretty spiritual circles today, but you don't fit in there. You just don't fit. That thing is drying up. And the Lord is drying up these things. Moving his people on toward himself. Move with God. With God. All right. What will happen? Well, he tells us exactly what will happen in your life. Then will be fulfilled John's prophecy. This beautiful thing. Have you got any valleys inside of you that you wish God would get in there and do something? Huh? Got any valleys? Well, he says, every valley shall be exalted. All those empty places, all those deep yawning, gnawing. Got any gnawings inside of you? Just gnaws in there. Do you know what I mean? Hunger and thirst and cries and calls and knowing for, for reality, for reality in God. Now, there are those who just love the old form. 
They love the old tradition. They, they just love it. They just love it. And I'm going to be a Methodist. My mother was a Methodist. My father was a Methodist. My grandparents were a Methodist. I'm going to be a Methodist till I die. Well, honey, you, you can be a Methodist and live, if you will. Because a lot of Methodists are receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost. A lot of Baptists are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. A lot of, just a lot of Presbyterians are receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And just a lot of Episcopalians are receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost. This, uh, when I go home, I just love to go into the Episcopal Church. Part of my family, uh, big part of my family are, are in the Episcopal Church. And my nephew is the crucifer there. And they just love to have that handsome thing. And I think he is handsome. Carry that cross down the aisle. And I go over there to watch him carry that cross down the aisle. I oh, God, you just bless Stevie good. Sometime when he's walking down that aisle, help him to know what that cross means. <clears throat> what that cross really means. His brother was crucified before him, and Jesus did get hold of him. And he's really and truly born again. I don't care what you are. I love them all. And say again, thank God for all the way that he's brought us. Now I want to go further than that. And say there's people right here in Trinity. You haven't lifted up your feet and got them going yet. There's some around here that's dragging your feet. I don't want the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians to think we're the perfect ones. We don't feel that way at all. But there's still people around here that are dragging your feet. You, while some people are deciding whether or not they're going to be saved, others are still deciding whether they're going to come on and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There are people around Trinity here who are dragging your feet about the crucified way. Whether you're going to come this crucified way and take up your cross and follow Jesus. The, he's dealing with every one of us and taking us out and taking us on just as fast as we will go on with him. Because there's always something more out there for us. You know, and he's getting together, getting together, you know, the word of God is wonderful. It's just wonderful. He's calling, he's dealing, he's burning. This, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I don't want you just to think of a little experience of speaking in other tongues, but I want you to come on in this baptized life until uh, every part of us and everything that's in us is under his divine possession. And we are as separated from this world as John the Baptist was as separated from this world. And we are as given to God as he was given to God. I believe God wants to give to this world a last hour witness and manifestation that Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. We've seen a couple miracles, but I believe God wants to, us to see them by the thousand. Amen. By the thousand. I believe this. But he's, he, God is not going to do it until he gets a crowd that's dead enough that he can use them and they won't touch the glory. And that's the reason we don't have more ministry like this and see more of this sort of thing. No, he's calling all of us, every one of us, to come on, to come on, and to separation, to death, to fullness, to complete maturity for a full revelation and manifestation and witness of Jesus Christ in this last hour. Joel prophesies about this and it'll come to pass in the last days that 
everyone, every whosoever will shall be delivered. Why, that is a mark. Every whosoever will. They have to will it and want it, but whosoever will shall be delivered. And it seems to me we're just quivering. We're just quivering on the edge of things right now. And you just feel to walk very softly before the Lord. And don't allow anything to happen in your life. Don't allow the devil to mar the work of God in any way whatsoever. For God's sake, don't go back to anything that God has brought you out of. But keep on coming on in the Lord Jesus Christ just as fast as you can. Die every death there is to die. Pay every price he asks you to pay. Give yourself to God for the revelation of Jesus Christ through you in this last hour. And you have the promise in your life. I was riding in a car between Riverside, driving into Los Angeles, and the Spirit of the Lord came on me in that car. I didn't know what was, for a minute, I didn't know what was going to happen. He began to sing through me a prophecy, and this is what he was singing and unfolding that to me for something in my own life. When he began to sing, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, the crooked shall all be straightened, and the rough shall be made plain. And he's, this is his promise to you individually. What mountains, what impossibilities in your life do you want him to deal with and bring down? This isn't impossible with him. It isn't impossible. Just a little bit of faith. Why, well, he says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, faith as a grain of mustard seed, he opened that to me and showed me what that was. While I was in Israel, I saw a little eeny, weeny, tiny, teeny mustard seed, the tiniest seed there is. And you're, when you plant that seed, you're supposed to plant it under an inch of earth. Now, if you would see that little eeny, weeny, tiny, teeny mustard seed and compare it to that inch of earth that's over it, that's a mountain over that mustard seed. That's a mountain over that mustard seed. Well, that little mustard seed's got faith enough to move that mountain and come right up there and live and grow, and that mountain just moves right away and moves over. If you've got faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into yonder sea, and it will, and it will. Oh, what promises God wants to fulfill in our lives. Everyone that's in there, they're all personal, and they're all for us. I don't know what he's talking to you about, how he's dealing with you, how he's leading you. That restlessness, that knowing. Let him answer it and meet it. And come on with God just as fast as you can. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, shall be delivered. What deliverance do you want? What deliverance do you need? What mountain do you want moved? What valley do you want God to bring up? What crooked thing do you want straightened out? What rough place in your life needs to be made smooth? He says, he challenges us to fall into his hands and come to him. And he says then, on top of that, I'll make your desert blossom like a rose. Is it worthwhile? It certainly is. We're right in that period. Stay in God. I say as I have said over and over again, this is the most glorious hour 
the church has ever had the hour of her most glorious opportunity. You never had an opportunity in all of your life like you're having today. For God's sake, for your sake, accept it and come on with Jesus Christ. All these ministers around here, all of these personal workers, they're trained around here for this very purpose, to deal with us, to help you in any need that you might have in your life. And if I were you, I'd get right up out of that seat and say, I'm going to pay the price at any cost. I'm going on into the light that God has given me, the thing that I know God wants in my life, the call that's upon me, Jesus, here I come. Here I come. And give yourself to him. If you're not saved, open your life to Jesus Christ. Just open it. Just the other day, a little woman walked right up to me. She says, I want to open my heart to Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? You open to Jesus. You, if you're not filled with the Spirit, you can be before you leave this church tonight. Come. Shall we stand? What number? Say Jesus, everybody. Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Say Jesus, everybody. Jesus. Is everything in you saying yes? Say yes. yes. Do you know I'll say yes? Do you know the chorus? I will say yes, yes, yes. I should have taught you that. I will say yes. Say yes. yes. Say yes. Say yes. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be terrible to say no? Wouldn't it be terrible to miss it? To miss what he has for us in this glorious hour? Just recently, one of the holiest saints, I believe, of our generation went home. And just before he left us, he says, God shows me something wonderful is coming, but I won't live to see it. But it's coming. It's coming. Don't say him nay. Say yes. Say it with your mind. Like you said yes. Yes. <clears throat> when you said yes to that man that proposed to you, when you said yes to her, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you my treasures. I give you my spirit. I give you my body. I give you my possessions. I give you my future. I give you all the rest of my life. All there is of me, I give it to you. And you said it with every cell of your body, 
with every power of your soul and every part of your spirit. Say yes to God like that. That means you put your, put your wife on the altar to do the will of God no matter what she says. That means you put your husband on the altar to do the will of God no matter what he says. That means that leaving, he says, mother, father, sister, brother, houses, land, to do the will of God, to walk with him. But it's lovely when whole families hand in hand say yes, yes. Husband, you take your wife by the hand and say, come on, honey, we're going to do the will of God. We're going to keep step with God. Take those lovely sons and daughters by the hand and say, Come on, come on, my wonderful son, my beautiful daughter. We're going to walk with God and do his will. We're not going to miss what God has for us in this last hour. Maybe you're alone. Maybe Jesus has made it so that you have to walk alone. But you're not alone, you know. Father's on one side, the Son's on the inside, the Holy Ghost is all over you, inside and outside, and you're not alone to help you to do the will of God. Oh, come on. Don't you love Jesus? And you want to do his will, don't you? What are we going to sing? We want to do his will. To say all to Jesus, I surrender. We've said that. That don't, honey, that don't seem just right. What do you want to sing? Oh, he won't. Oh, he won't. Wouldn't it be awful to be passed by? Oh, oh, if I want to cry. To be passed by? Don't pass me by. While on others you're calling and ministering to others, don't pass me by. If I was down there where you are, I'd run into that prayer room and get down at his feet. I don't know what number that is. I don't think we need any number. Play that, honey. We'll sing it, and you run to him just as fast as you can come. If you're not saved, I know you want. Who wants to open your heart to Jesus? You're not saved. You want to open your heart to him tonight. Yes, honey, you come and open your heart to Jesus. Who else? You're not saved. You want to open your heart to Jesus. You want to open your heart. Do you want to come, sweetheart? Open your heart to Jesus. Open it to him. Open your heart to Jesus. How many of you have not yet received the baptism in the Holy Ghost? Put up your hands. You haven't yet received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. You know what I want? I want you to be the first ones into that prayer room. I want you all to go in there and all stay together in the same place. All of you who want the baptism in the Holy Ghost. All of you go in the baptism and all stay together in the same place. Come on, there was some more over there and some over here who raised your hands. You haven't yet received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. Come and let him baptize you. Fill you. Put this speaking voice inside of you to direct your life in the will of God. 
That's all right. Just kneel all together so we can just circle around you, surround you, pray with you for this holy and filling. That's right. Just come right on. And all of you get together and just stay in the same place. That's right. That's right. Come right on. That's right. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All right. How many of you feel the Spirit drawing you out of some things you don't fit into? Huh? He's drawing you out of things you don't fit into. Put your hands up high. Put them way up high. You don't fit. Out. Uh-huh. I know it. I know it. I know it. I just know it. And you're coming out, aren't you? You're coming out and saying yes to God. You don't belong there and you don't fit there. And follow that call of God to your heart. All right, you can be the next crowd that goes in. Come on. Just you be the next crowd that goes. Just, all right, you come on. Be the next crowd. He's calling it out. You just don't fit there and you want to come and tell him that you're coming out you're going to pay the price to walk with him and do his sacred will praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord all right I know the Spirit of God is talking with others and dealing with others whatever he's saying to you do it and you answer the call, and you can be the next ones come. Let's sing this song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. All right? Pass me not, O Gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. to do his part and give his call and deal with us. He's so gentle in his dealing and his calling and tenderly show us the way. And he's, he's waiting for our response. <clears throat> the glorious gospel is that Jesus loves us. And sin is when we tell God we don't want his love. Don't do that, but embrace his love and follow this Jesus whithersoever he goeth. We'll sing it one more time for you. And all who want to pray and come and wait before the Lord, you come. You go into the prayer room. You can kneel here at the altar. You can kneel in your pew where you are or sit there in the seat and pray. We're here to help you and counsel you, <clears throat> talk with you, 
Any way that we can help you, we'll be glad to do it. While we sing the verse one more time, all right? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. One or another's thou art calling. Do not pass me by. like to pray with you before we close the service. Is there anybody yet in the auditorium that by the uplifted hand you will say, pray for me? Anybody who will slip up your hand? Yes. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Precious Father, you see these uplifted hands. You know the language of these uplifted hands, and I ask thee, Father, to continue thy love over their life, thy wooing and dealing in their lives. Do for them the thing that they need. Give them that grace that is necessary to take the step that you're asking them to take. Put thy power upon them and in them. Give them strength to obey you, give them grace for the day in which we're living, the circumstance, the trial, the rough place that's before them, that mountain that seems too much or that valley that seems too low, thou art sufficient for everything. So we just commit the people into thy tender care and pray thou wilt continue thy love over them until thou art glorified in them. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you.